Good evening and welcome to Open Minds, the Open Universities series of talks. Tonight's topic is From Underground to Outer Space, Studying the Impact of Volcanoes. We're delighted to have you with us tonight, either here at our campus in Milton Keynes, or if you're joining us remotely, welcome. Before we start, for those who are here in person, I'd like to draw your attention to the health and safety details on the slide. If you're following us on Twitter, or you want to tweet, it's hashtag OUTalks, and of course you can access this event through live stream, and the details are up. I'm sure many of you will remember the 2010 volcanic eruption in Iceland and the chaos the ash clouds caused locally and to air travel. As a result, the world is now better equipped to respond to a crisis if it happens again. However, the bigger question our speakers from the Open University Science Faculty will explore tonight is whether we are now equipped to spot the signs of another major volcanic eruption anywhere in the world. Our academics will describe the devastation and environmental impact caused by recent volcanic eruptions and demonstrate how their research is mitigating the effect of these eruptions and predicting new hazards and will unveil a system to monitor volcanoes through satellite from space 24 hours a day, anywhere in the world. Tonight, our first speaker will be Professor Hazel Reimer, Dean of the OU's Faculty of Science. And she'll describe her research with Earthwatch and use of citizen scientists. Next, you'll hear from Dave Dr. Dave McGarvey, Senior Lecturer in the Faculty of Science, who explores the likelihood of another disruptive Icelandic eruption and presents research illuminating the potential impact of eruptions from other Icelandic volcanoes. And finally, you'll hear from Professor Fabrizio Ferrucci, Professor in Geophysics in the Faculty of Science, who will reveal a new system inspired by EVOS. EVOS stands for European Volcano Observatory Space Services. EVOS, developed at the OU, made it possible to monitor volcanoes from space. I hope you find this an, ex an inspiring exchange of views and ask you to save up your questions for our speakers until the end when there'll be an opportunity for a panel Q&A discussion. For those of you who join us online, use the hashtag, hashtag at OUTalks, to join in the conversation. But without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Hazel Reimer. Hello, welcome. Um, volcanoes and the contribution of citizen scientists. Well, you can't start any talk like this without defining a volcano. Um, usually we think of a volcano as a nice pointy peak thing, perhaps with, with some snow on the top, like these very well-behaved volcanoes over here. Um, quite often they're actually really rather small, unimpressive-looking cinder cones. Um, but more often they're a great big hole in the ground. They don't look impressive at all. In fact, they're so unimpressive that people tend to build uh, villages and towns in them quite often. Um, and when you have large explosions, you then have some growth inside a, a cone afterwards. So the, the point is that volcanoes come in all shapes and sizes, and their impacts similarly are, are all shapes and sizes. A question I often get is, are there more volcanoes now than there used to be? They seem to be in the news all of the time. Are there more of them? Well, if we look back through the record, going back to the 1400s through to more or less now, the number of known volcanoes has certainly increased through time. The number of 
volcanoes active along this curve here has increased through time and so has the population. So obviously volcanoes cause population increase. <laughs> it just shows you, you can prove anything with statistics and, and graphs. Now of course what, what this is actually suggesting is that there are more people around and uh, they're aware and able to, to report on volcanoes and, and their eruptions. But what's actually rather interesting is if we look in the detail of, the, of this last part here where um, increases in the numbers of volcanoes uh, appear to have happened. And so here we're going from the 1800s on to, to the present time. If we look at all eruptions here, okay, they've increased through time. Uh, sorry, the, the number of eruptions um, have increased a little bit, and that's, as I showed earlier, because there are more people looking at these things now. There are some interesting dips here, or, or interesting features altogether. The eruption of Krakatoa in 1883 and the eruption of uh, Montpellier in 1902 uh, do seem to be associated with an increase in, in activity or, or perhaps reporting of activity for a period of time when people were very excited about it. Then there were some periods here, World War I and World War II, when volcanic activity decreased. Or <laughs> or perhaps interest um, or, or ability to, to, to record these things decreased. But perhaps the most significant is this bottom graph here, which shows the size of eruptions over about um, 0.1 cubic kilometer. So they're sort of reasonable size, but not enormous volcanic eruptions, has broadly sp speaking stayed more or less the same in the last couple of hundred years where records are, are, are really quite um, secure. So no, they haven't changed dramatically in, in uh, human times. I'm going to talk a little bit now about a project I've been involved with for some time now with Open University students and Earthwatch volunteers. And it's been based in a country, uh, Nicaragua, here in, in uh, Central America. We've also worked in, in Costa Rica. But uh, just focusing here in Nicaragua, here's Nicaragua, has a nice long line of, of volcanoes in it. They, they form part of the Pacific Ring of Fire. Um, and on a map like this, they're, they're nice little triangles and they're, you know, proper volcano-shaped volcanoes. You look at Google Maps and you wouldn't even know that they were volcanoes, actually. This dotted line here marks the outer part, of the, the big caldera structure um, of the Messiah volcano. Most of it doesn't look at all like a volcano. It's got a great big lake in it. It's got people living on the edges here. But it does have some little holes here, which are the active craters. It's got several active craters, in fact. If you happen to be taking snapshots from the space shuttle, this is what you would see. Uh, here's Central America, and this is here, this is Messiah Volcano, and this is a plume of uh, gas, mostly water, but also sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, and various other gases coming out of the volcano and disappearing off there into the uh, Pacific. And if you're closer to the ground, that's what it looks like. Uh, looks like a lot of cloud most of the time and, and nothing too significant. Um, you land at the airport and really it just looks like some cloud on the horizon. It does help if you've got a label on it, but there is the Messiah <laughs> volcano degassing away quietly, apparently not doing any harm to anybody. If you are growing coffee crops, though, nearby, you sometimes find this happens. Can you see around the edges here? They're burned um, with acid rain, basically, that's, that's being dumped out uh, from the volcano. So that, that's very much a, a, a local environmental impact. If your gateway here um, is made of metal, you can see that easily gets corroded. And a lot of people use corrugated iron roofs, and they also get corroded and, of course, don't work quite so well in the rainy season um, if you live downwind of the volcano. So there are a lot of local environmental impacts of this sort of volcanic activity. We call this persistent degassing. Not surprisingly, because it keeps on degassing. So what's this got to do with citizen scientists? Well, you will have heard lots about citizen science in the news over, over the last several months and, and years. It's becoming a, an increasingly used term, and it means all sorts of things to different people. It can mean um, using your computer, uh, the CPU time on your computer, to do some calculations, and you don't actually have to do, have anything to do with it. It can involve you downloading some images and looking through them, because actually people are rather better than software for, for picking out certain things in images, and th this is used for uh, some of the astronomy-type projects. 
Other projects involve, as, as these people here are, collecting all sorts of strange bits of data, which as an individual piece of data seems a bit mad, but you put it all together and always um, the whole is much greater than, than, the, uh, um, than, than the individual parts of, of data that you collect. Um, this is an oceanography project, of course, but uh, we can do exactly the same sort of thing on a volcano. And the great advantage to using citizen scientists is, for a start, they are there because they want to be. So unlike uh, some students, not open university students, obviously, but like some students, they, they really want to be there and they really, really want to, to be engaged with, with the work that's going on. They come from all sorts of walks of life and so provide a ter terrific amount of support and insights just because they do other things in, in their real lives. Quite often they're electrical engineers, for example, and they can fix our pieces of kits. So that's really helpful. <laughs> but there, there are all sorts of other reasons. And, and another is that for the sort of monitoring work that, that I do on, on uh, the volcanoes I'm looking at, I need to keep making these measurements over and over again over a long period of time. And you can't do that without a, a lot, an army of people coming to help make the measurements. So this is what it looks like at Messiah Volcano on, on the ground here. And, uh, the, well, it sometimes looks like this. These are obviously not citizen scientists here because they're running away, um, not, not looking at it and, and making the measurements. Um, so this volcano, it degasses quietly most of the time, but every now and then it has a, a vent-clearing episode where so it has a little explosion. Um, what are the, the citizen scientists doing? They're doing these sorts of measurements, groveling around in the mud, um, making, in this case, resistivity measurements. Quite a lot of standing around by an expensive piece of kit, pressing buttons every now and then, um, sometimes a bigger piece of kit. Um, sometimes setting pieces of kit up and leaving them to record, um, doing the same sort of thing, looking down into the crater there. Um, but the point is there are lots and lots of different types of measurements that we need to make. And one solution is to find yourself a fantastic research student, give him a gas mask, put all the pieces of kit on his back, and send him on his way. <laughs> Uh, they, they wear out. You can't do that for long. <laughs> I've tried. So how much better to take your team of, of uh, volunteers, uh, citizen scientists, and th this is me training them making, gra this is a gravity meter, you can't really see it in there, but making gravity measurements, GPS and, and gas and various other measurements, teach people how to make these measurements and then they can go off and, and make measurements themselves and you can get many, many more measurements um, in, a, in a particular amount of time. All, there, there is no limit, as far as I have discovered so far, to what volunteers can actually do. They, they're very willing to be trained up to do anything and their, their tolerance for doing awful things is, is huge. <laughs> um, well, they're not awful. It's just very hot there. Um, so as an example of the sorts of things that we've we've been able to do is we've been able to look at the sulfur dioxide flux, that's the amount of sulfur dioxide coming out of the volcano over a long period of time. And when you make an individual measurement, you don't really, of course you don't know what the next measurement's going to be, but you don't know what that's telling you about the volcano until you've got this long series to look at. And here these red lines indicate when there were eruptions. So now we can see when the, the uh, level of gas goes down, an eruption of some sort follows. And we can develop a, a, a plumbing system, a model for what's going on in the subsurface underneath the active crater at this volcano. Here's the active vent. This is a cross section through the other craters. And underneath this active vent, we have bubbly rock and much harder, um, more consolidated, less gas rich uh, rock underneath it. And all we're looking at is the ratio or the thickness of, of the two. So we get a bigger, thicker, frothy layer on the top there, um, and we can actually monitor that through time using these geophysical measurements. Some other measurements that we do in the field is with these Petri dishes here that we make here in the labs. Um, we stick them with lots and lots of duct tape onto various trees around the, the volcano, um, and we also compare those results with these things here. I hope you can just about make them out. Tillandsia, air plants, you can buy them in garden centres here. They're very expensive, but they grow all over the place. And, Messiah Volcano. 
Um, if you map out, see these little red dots here, these are all the places citizen scientists went off and, and made these measurements. They were looking at the air plants, measuring the, the quality and quantity of them, looking at the gas and, 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 uh, and other things, and putting these, these sulfation plates up next to them so we could see how, what the quality of the air was. And what we found was that where we had a huge amount of, of gas coming out of the volcano, we had no or very poor quality Tillandsia plants, and, and that tells us that we've actually discovered here a, a rather uh, cheap and, and easy gas monitoring system. Uh, but it does, it does help us to see what the air quality in, in the particular volcano is. So here are some citizen scientists at the end of the day um, preparing samples. This is uh, grass samples that they're preparing for analysis, and one of the best things, of course, is you get to sit and chat um, afterwards. But as I say, always they provide a huge amount of information and, and help for us with our project. They come up with all sorts of ideas because no idea is, is too crazy to come up with. But often, if you're not a professional scientist, you, you dare to ask some other things that we wouldn't perhaps want to. So I'll, I'll just finish with uh, I'm, Michael. I'm Michael Perkins. I'm from Edinburgh in Scotland. I'm studying geosciences at the Open University at the moment. I've always wanted to come to Latin America and, and I love the country. Yeah. But the project itself has been great as well. I love working with people who really understand the science here. I, I think the thing I find most rewarding is being able to go out and make measurements and really contribute to the science effort. To do things that, that without so many volunteers here, just we wouldn't be able to, to gather as much data. And that, that for me is the most rewarding thing, to, to really be able to contribute. To, uh, to learn in the field is uh, uh, very great uh, experience for me. It's great to go out into the field and do, do experiments and to be able to take your data from, from something like this and use that to, to build it into a project or something like that would be amazing. It, it gives you much better, much more in-depth knowledge of the, the field and it inspires you. If you can, go and do a, an expedition like this because it's well, well worthwhile. You see the local culture, you um, work with real scientists. It's an amazing, amazing experience um, and definitely worth, worth trying. <laughs>
bubbles, and lots of them produce an explosive eruption, as in the EF of 2010. I've called it a perfect eruption, so why do I call it a perfect eruption? There's really five key factors that made this so disruptive to, to us. Um, it was unusually long-lived. I mean, 45 days is a very long time for an explosive eruption. It also produced an unreasonable amount of very fine ash, the sort of fine ash that can be carried very long distances, absolutely perfect for disrupting European airspace. And the winds actually took the ash direct towards us. It didn't go swirling over the North Atlantic for days before coming to us. It took it straight from Iceland to us. And a dry weather period as well meant that we didn't see much of the ash being washed out by weather, by winds, by, by rain. And, and perhaps the key one was, uh, at the time, the flight rules basically said, if there's ash in the sky, you don't fly. So suddenly, we found ourselves in a position, and I don't think it's happened since the Second World War, where there wasn't any aircraft in the sky at all. The whole place ground to a standstill. Absolutely fascinating. Well, I found it fascinating. And people say, how, can, how on earth can you come up with a confusing name like AF Yatka Yoko? Well, the Oatmeal came up with a rather nice idea. I'll let you enjoy it for a moment. I like the description. Big and angry. Probably going to blow up and ruin everyone's vacation soon. So there you are. That's a nice little way. So I'll come back to AF Yatalyoko later and say why it wouldn't be a problem if it happened again or a bigger problem. But the year afterwards, does anybody remember Greensvot blowing up the year afterwards? Yeah, a few people do. Well, to volcanologists, it's become a little bit forgotten because uh, everybody still was working on AF Yatalyoko when this went off. So it didn't really get the uh, attention it deserved. Um, it was unexpectedly large. It was massive. It produced more ash in one day than AF Yatlego did in 45 days. And the plume going up reached 20 kilometres. AF Yatlego reached about 10. So it's double the size of the plume. And it's quite a complex eruption. This You just see this great big umbrella cloud. But if I move the cursor ever so slightly, you've got a lot of steam in this point here. You've got a lot of brown ash coming here, and you get this very strange ground-hugging brown ash going off down to the south. So a lot was going on in that particular volcano, and it was worthy of, of much further study. And perhaps why it was forgotten was it did not cause the disruption that Eja uh, did, because the ash took a very circuitous route from Iceland, swirled around to the north, around to the west, before it trickled towards the UK. And the red colour is where we've got a, an ash concentration of more than 4,000 milligrams per cubic metre. And that's where you shouldn't take an aircraft into that. You notice it's over Scotland. <laughs> yeah. By a wonderful twist of irony, I, my flight was meant to take off that day to Iceland. <laughs> so I was stuck for a few days until the ash cloud cleared. Um, I was fortunate enough, uh, slightly after Greenwald erupted in 2011, to join an expedition to go out and have a look at it. And it was quite a bizarre scene to see this uh, beautiful ice cap with up to 700 metres of ice covered in this fresh ash, which was still going down. And uh, the bottom left image shows the, uh, the hole melted into the glacier by that eruption, that very complex eruption. And part of the fun was getting to drive around in massive jeeps. Um, which is all, you know, if you're a boy, you can't really ignore that stuff. And that Jeep has 48-inch tyres, so um, that gives you a size of a scale. They go absolutely anywhere. So here's the take-home messages before I move on to some of my own work um, to get out of these two eruptions. That uh, AF Yatlioko 2010 was not a typical eruption because typical eruptions only last up to about a week, not 45 days. And that's what Greenswatt did. It was very typical of what we might expect from a volcanic eruption in Iceland, short, sharp blast, a lot of ash in the air, and then you're crossing your fingers that it doesn't actually end up coming over the UK. Number four, the changes to the ash detection and the flight rules means we'll never see disruption like this again. There's no more an ash in the sky you don't fly rule. We now fly when there's ash in the sky, but within safe limits, safe concentrations. So the current thinking is that if we had an eruption absolutely identical to AF Yatlioko tomorrow, uh, with exactly the same conditions, weather conditions, etc., 25% of or less of the flights that were cancelled in 2010 would be cancelled. So I think if you need a bit of reassurance, that's hopefully a little bit there. Okay, what are the future? Should we expect more volcanic ash cores from Iceland? Yes, 
definitely. Um, we sort of dodged the bullet, really, um, since 1947, one of the last big ones from a volcano called Hecla. We've had a number of eruptions. It could have affected us, but um, it's the growth of commercial air flight which is causing us a problem um, because, of course, eruptions affect that. The little diagram there, don't worry too much about it. The um, rectangle highlights the uh, diagram on the left with all the numbers. It's showing eruptions in Iceland from the 1300s onwards. And Greensvot is um, Iceland's most frequently erupting volcano. And we've seen uh, Barthabunga um, went off at the end of last year into the beginning of this year. Um, so we've got quite a lot of volcanoes that are potentially active in Iceland. And there's the locations of them. The last three, Yafjatli uh, 2010 down at the bottom, Greensvot 2011 in the centre of the uh, Vatna Yuko ice cap, and then Barthabunga that went off at the tail end of the last year, beginning of this year. Um, showing two locations because one is the location under the ice where all the action started and then the actual eruption itself took place beyond the ice out to the north. Katla, down at the very bottom in white, is the one that everybody's worried about because up until this century, uh, sorry, last century, it used to go off twice a century, creating rather large eruptions, and it hasn't really done a big eruption since 1918. And that's the one that's been quite heavily monitored at the moment. Uh, I'm going to talk about two volcanoes that uh, myself and my PhD students from Open University are working on. Uh, one down the bottom right called Rvjökull, and one over to the uh, left called Tinfjöttjökull. Great names, aren't they? Great names. <laughs> so Rvjökull in 1362 had a massive explosive eruption, and when you go there today, all you can see are the remnants of this eruption, are, are this sort of slightly pale-looking material draping the landscape here, on top of this, uh, this lava here. And, um, but that's not what it looked like when it did erupt. We have no reliable eyewitness, eyewitness reports of it because people scarpered out of the area due to massive earthquakes. But from reconstructing what's on the ground, it would have been pretty much like Pinatubo in 1991 with an eruption calling up to about 34 kilometers. Now, Eyjafjallokó went up to about 10, Greens up to 20, this is 34. This is an absolutely massive eruption. And uh, it happened not that long ago in geological terms in Iceland. So what we're doing is looking at the deposits from eruption and reconstructing what actually happened as a means of helping us understand what could potentially happen to Western Europe in terms of the ash coming over, but also looking to assist the Icelanders in local hazards and what might happen should we have another eruption. Two very simple ways in which material excuse me, falls out of an eruption column. One, it just falls out, and you get class dropping out in what we call airfall. And we can go to the deposits from this eruption, and we can identify the material that fell out of eruption during airfall, and from that we can tell all sorts of interesting information about how high the, the eruption plume was, which direction the wind was, and various other key bits of information used to reconstruct eruption. And I have an OU student working on this, and we forensically dissect the different phases of eruption to see what's going on. And it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of measurements in the field. It's a small team. Perhaps something for citizen scientists, actually, to do lots of these measurements. And one of the other uh, hazards from an eruption, more local rather than the, the airfall that comes over Britain, is pyroclastic flows, which some people call PDC, is called pyroclastic density currents. Um, you don't want to be in the pathway of one of these. They're um, very hot, about um, 400, 500 degrees centigrade, and they can travel at about um, 200 kilometers an hour, so you can't get out of the way. Um, and we found evidence at uh, Orvyokol for, after the very first part of the eruption, we've got the soil down here in the bottom right. We have a number of thin airfall layers. And then we find evidence of two separate phases of pyroclastic flow activity. And above that, we've got another five meters of various types of ash and various types of information going on. So this is just a very early part of the eruption. It's one of the most complex eruptions I know of. So we're having fun dissecting that, and the information will be used to help us understand uh, what effects another eruption of this kind might have in Iceland, but also over Western Europe. And in particular, uh, this is another view of the volcano. Just to give you an impression, it's, got a, it's about two kilometres from the farmland in the bottom left to the summit. So two kilometres, it's a fair old distance. Um, and climbing around on the upper slopes below the ice, um, it does involve a little bit of hiking up and down. 
Um, but it's a lot of fun, and it's a wonder of discovery because you're always discovering new stuff. That's one of the real buzzes from doing, doing research. So there's the uh, location again. We've just been to Orwayoko down in the right in the southeast. I'm now going to take you to uh, the final volcano, Tinfjallayoko, over towards the west. And I've got an OUPHD student to start it. We don't know anything about this volcano, apart from the fact that it may have produced a very large eruption about 50,000 years ago that would have sent um, another enormous ash cloud across Western Europe. So we basically got a, a great deal of fun going there and working out what, what was actually happening. Um, we do it, for example, by looking from a distance and seeing what's going on and making some guesstimates about what we using our experience to, to map the volcano from a distance. But you have to get up close and personal if you're really going to understand the volcano. And this one's quite fun because you have a lot of crumbling up and down on ridges, on scree, and you get the opportunity for some nice sunset pictures as well. So, and there we go. So we just started this project. We've had a, a, a 10 days on it last September, and my students out there at the moment, and I'll be joining them in a couple of weeks to continue the research on this volcano. And my final slide is a big question. When will the next Icelandic eruption happen? Well, Iceland tends to produce an eruption every three to four years, and we've seen this pattern continuing for centuries. We have some candidates that we think might go off, and um, the wonderful aspect about the Icelanders are they know the volcanoes very well. This is part of the underground that's in the title of this, uh, this entire session. They have equipment uh, there to detect what's happening beneath the surface, uh, seismic energy, ground deformation, and in the past few eruptions they've been able to give us a week to two weeks notice that an eruption is about to happen by using this equipment to detect the movement of molten rock beneath the surface under volcanoes before it actually starts to erupt. So I can't tell you when it's going to happen, I can't tell you where it's going to happen, but we should get a couple of weeks' notice of what might happen next eruption, and using that we can look ahead to see what the weather might be doing and use that to mitigate any possible impacts on the UK. Thank you. I'll hand over now to Fabrizio. Good evening. Well, um, I think I'll move to the next uh, slide. Um, the difference with respect to the call to the talks of uh, my colleagues is that uh, uh, we move uh, volcanologists away from volcanoes. So that's uh, maybe an advantage for volcanologists. It's surely not, not an advantage for scientists. But in any case, it's a, a bit way different. Uh, the reason for is that we have uh, plenty of volcanoes worldwide. And if, you, if we think global, we have to monitor them, all of them, at once. And this is the good reason for that is not only environment, but also because we have, uh, well, take Iceland. Iceland stranded uh, uh, thousands of flights and hundreds of thousand passengers and caused uh, damage for, uh, say, 10 billion uh, pounds minimum. And uh, this can happen everywhere. And uh, airlines flying from uh, London to any other place in the world, for instance, flying from, uh, say, Los Angeles to uh, Japan, they have uh, to fly over tens of volcanoes, all poten potentially erupting. And uh, creating volcanic eruptions with uh, clouds and so forth. So the problem is serious, and uh, how to monitor uh, 1,500 uh, volcanoes uh, which, are, which are considered to be active as they have erupted at least once in the last 12,000 years. Um, well, uh, we have three ways. Well, one is that, of course, of being very close, ground-based. That's uh, not uh, uh, citizen scientists. They're crazy scientists, very close. <laughs> it's uh, Montserrat is the, was the last uh, eruption in, on British land. And on the left, this is very close, definitely. On the left, you have uh, taken from uh, airplane. It's quite close, dangerous as well. 
And the third case uh, is not uh, close at all. It's from satellite. And uh, that's a development. You, you don't see the island, but you see that in uh, about uh, three hours, uh, the cloud has covered as much as 2,000 kilometers. And uh, on the right, this is a, a perfect modeling by uh, this is showing what can be done today. So you can uh, establish, which is the concentration, this is sulfur dioxide. And you, say, you can see with the framework, uh, the framework of every 15 minutes, you can predict, observe and predict where is uh, the, the cloud and which is the concentration. Sulfur dioxide can be dangerous for uh, as minor danger for uh, uh, aircraft. But uh, usually it's considered uh, to be accompanying ash. So in both cases, this is a, something that should be done everywhere, anytime, worldwide. So the, the challenge, uh, this is done for meteorology, but it's not done for volcanology. So we have to reach this point. Let's say how. Uh, again, here you see something, this Mount Etna, and what is in red, definitely, is what is uh, melt. So what is in red is uh, uh, the source of uh, heat from the crater, and what you see developing in black is ash. So with, uh, this is uh, observed from 36,000 kilometers above Earth. It's a geostationary satellite. And this is available because it's a meteorological satellite. And you can see that uh, you, have, uh, you can have control both on the cloud and on uh, the source. So we can do it, but we don't. And the point is that why we cannot do this? Well, uh, if you take this and you have uh, uh, 1,500 volcanoes, means that you need a very complex system for handling that. Uh, is sufficiently, this is not sufficient. You have to be real time. You have to monitor this point, these important hotspots, what we call them hotspots. And then after that, you have to calculate to compute. Of course, you don't have the time of looking at a picture as, as the one you see there. But uh, from this picture, you can see that there are moments in which every measure it every five minutes in which you can find that this probable ash it means that your ash cloud is not yet developed but you can uh, predict that it could be in moments. And uh, again, this should be done everywhere, all the time. So you cannot look at that. Some machine has to do this for you. And the machine cannot be wrong. So the, this is the main challenge. And from that, what you do? When you are on ground, say you are an observatory, Consider that uh, worldwide there are 1,500 volcanoes, but uh, you can uh, count maybe 30, 30 uh, good observatories, meaning that almost 1,500 volcanoes are not observed from ground. But if you had an observatory there, you could do something, if I can, yeah. You could compute the development of the lava flow you inject in your computing code, from your computing code, how many cubic meters per second you have measured by satellite, you insert there and you see the lava flow, when it can go, how long it takes, and when it will be stop. This is the main problem for volcanology. Scientists mainly look at prediction, but uh, once the prediction is done, then you have to predict when the eruption will be over, where the, vo the lava flow will stop, and so forth. This is more, much more difficult because this impact directly on your civil protection operations. And, uh, and this bears major responsibilities. So everybody wants to avoid it, <laughs> of course. Uh, let's go ahead uh, more recently um, where this can of course, this is useful everywhere for uh, airlines, whatever, and so forth. But very recently, the la most recent, mm, say, major eruption involving uh, major uh, uh, civil protection problems was in, in Fogo, Cape Verde. Cape Verde is a very poor country. So they have 
they have a, a minimal organization, so have some seismic station, they have some uh, good volcanologists, they don't have money for doing too much. And uh, therefore, um, they ask it is almost in real time. We knew that the eruption was going on because you had just detected that it was happening. And they asked us to tell them what. Uh, the flow, uh, you see the flow in, uh, in uh, this picture, and uh, the, the, the risk was that the flow could escape this uh, summit caldera, this sort of hole at the top of the volcano, and go downslope. Going downslope, all major cities are downslope. It's not a very big, uh, so you have um, uh, 150,000 people living on the island, but 150,000, if one third of 150,000 is threatened by, by a, a, an eruption, is very much. And therefore, the risk was, uh, are we able to predict if this flow will go out of the caldera and go down, or stay within the caldera, in that case, take the picture, it's fine. So you have a picture, nobody's there, it's okay. Uh, question, uh, we were able to answer this question and it was not that easy. Uh, we were observing the start of the eruption when you see red means that it's starting, indeed. This is uh, with uh, 15 minutes uh, uh, observation rate and this is the very few hours of uh, the beginning of the eruption. And uh, uh, you see that that uh, red can correspond to a measure of a cubic meter per second, the flow of magma from the, the bocas, from the crater. This is what is uh, uh, shown, because uh, in observatory you usually uh, you do uh, graphs, and in the graphs you have uh, uh, the time against the cubic meter per second. So you know every five minutes, in this case every 15 minutes, what's happening, and therefore which is the prediction in terms of length of your flow. And uh, up. Uh, this is what you see from uh, with a very high resolution picture, you see the, the, the flow. This is in near infrared. But, uh, well, this is very nice. The picture above is very nice, but you can take this picture seldom. There were four taken during the eruption. The eruption lasted for two months. So basically, you cannot use them for doing anything, just for knowing in detail. But uh, uh, no, it's not sufficient for, for uh, organizing a response. Uh, conversely, we were able to know, uh, everybody understands, from, on the left you have uh, uh, the, uh, the history of uh, the eruption. You see that the eruption starts very strong and then after a few days of uh, confusion, then uh, declines. And you can say the, uh, the, the end of the eruption is where you have no, no more points. Basically, you can say that after 20 days, that nothing uh, uh, serious was going to happen. And we, we told them, and we luckily we were right. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, <laughs> some responsibility, but not so much. And on the other side, which is interesting in terms of uh, what you are, this is more uh, scientifically interesting, while you are uh, detecting uh, how many cubic meters per second are being erupted, and therefore your flow, how long it will go, how far we go. On the same time, you can compute how many cubic meters have been erupted. And therefore, you know from, say, 20 days, between 10 and 30 days after the start of the eruption, that have been erupted about 10 million cubic meters, and the end will be 11 million cubic meters. So from both graphs, you know that something, that the situation is no longer serious. Uh, what is needed? Well, plenty of things are needed for global volcano monitoring, indeed, because uh, the advantage, as uh, 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 speakers before me said, probably, is uh, um, the advantage of volcanoes is first that you know where they are, which is not the case for earthquakes. And uh, second, uh, that you have uh, plenty of uh, uh, measurement that makes sense. You can measure uh, thermal power, uh, if you see top left, uh, there is a very nice picture taken from satellite, 700 kilometers above Earth. And what you see is a, what you call a lava lake. 
is something wide about uh, one kilometer is the, the, the hole, the crater, and within that you have 100 meters in, in which you see a, a network of uh, reddish lava. You see that from 700 kilometers. You cannot see every day. You cannot see, uh, say, once per month, maybe, but you can do it. And second, gas fluxes. Uh, the red uh, spot is a, a volcano in between Eritrea and Ethiopia, Nabro. Nabro was a volcano, um, uh, oversleeping is the word, meaning that it was sleeping since a very long while, and uh, probably 5,000 years. But uh, scientists uh, do not agree uh, <laughs> on that uh, figure. But uh, uh, suddenly, this uh, volcano erupted. Why suddenly? Because uh, the place is a very uh, delicate place, because in the boundary between Ethiopia and Eritrea is a place of uh, a past war, very recent war. Uh, you have uh, anti-personal landmines. Uh, it's a place where you have nobody excepting few nomads, etc. Therefore, you have don't, you don't have an observatory, indeed. And so the volcano suddenly started erupting, and uh, of course he had certainly had there were uh, uh, precursory signs, but nobody could uh, saw them, see them. And uh, uh, the, what you see there is the story of the sulfur dioxide dioxide emitted by that volcano. In two days and a half, it went to Egypt, then to Afghanistan, then to China. So we can track it, we can measure it, meaning that we can do plenty of things. Uh, the story here in uh, bottom right, you have uh, the, this uh, uh, ash cloud, and uh, uh, finally you have uh, other things that can be measured by radar satellites, and uh, all this is feasible. This is feasible in uh, real time, near real time, delay time, but it's feasible. What is the problem is that each of, uh, and there are, you would say, 20 to 25 satellites today that could measure uh, everything everywhere. The problem is organization. And uh, if the, the problem is global, global means that you need a global organization. So the real problem I see, I think that uh, science is there, technology is there, everything is feasible. And it's not that expensive, in my opinion. That expensive means that we could set uh, up a preliminary service with uh, 10 million. 10 million is nothing. It's less than one kilometer of uh, motorway, if you want. But uh, <coughs> with uh, plus, 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 no TVA, no v VAT. <laughs> uh, the, the point is that uh, uh, for that you need a something which is between political, diplomatic, and uh, science, the three things. There is a, a good um, case, is the case of uh, meteorology. Meteorology works worldwide and 24-7. We should be able to do that. I think that it is feasible. I am personally confident that before retiring, I see something of that. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Hazel, uh, Dave, and Fabrizio. That was inspiring material, and I'm sure it's left us all uh, with a great deal to think about and even put a few questions. So now it's time for you to erupt <laughs> uh, for your questions and comments until around 7.30, when we invite you to stay and have some cheese and drink with us and chat more informally with the speakers and other guests here tonight. But for time being, let the panel rejoin us. So Hazel, David, uh, and Fruzizio, if you could join us on the panel. <laughs> Just down that way. Thank you. Let me just settle in. Uh, we've already got a couple of questions from Facebook. And I will say I will take your questions from here. 
Uh, when you put your question, uh, please say who you are and where you're from. And please, if possible, keep your questions short so uh, we can answer as many questions as possible in the time allowed. Um, so, any questions? Oh, yes, one at the back. So the microphone will get to you. Uh, question for David. Um, uh, did you have any involvement with the uh, Mocker aircraft, the Met Office Civil Contingency aircraft, the design for sniffing, sniffing the air, basically, which is what the you know, which is what you were talking about for air monitoring? Myself or Fabrizio? Um, well, I more uh, uh, focused on uh, satellites than uh, aircraft. Yeah. But uh, the advanced, uh, maybe I can give some, uh, my opinion, if you want. <clears throat> we are not, uh, not using that. But this is done usually when you have an a, a crisis. Uh, the point with aircraft that you can, you have two points. So the first, you have, you have to fly through. And this, uh, if you don't know yet which is the concentration of ash, for instance, can be dangerous. And independent if you are a jet or uh, with a propeller, in both cases. Uh, the second point is that in terms of timeliness, uh, it's, uh, the response is delayed because you have to know where is the eruption, where is, uh, how far you are from that, then you have to fly your aircraft, and then it takes time. Probably the best is that you uh, run both things together. So you have a satellite observation, and with that you, you refine your observation through aircraft. It would be good. Yeah. If I could maybe actually answer the question, sorry. Um, I didn't have any involvement with uh, that aspect of the, uh, the two eruptions in Iceland. I'm very much a, a ground-based man, and uh, my job is really going out and looking at the source of eruptions and trying to, to use that. But... Um, Certainly during the, the 2010 and 2011 eruptions, the, uh, the Met Office aircraft were used quite extensively. Um, and they got quite a, bit, a little bit damaged, certainly in 2010. I think one of them wasn't actually working in 2011. They had no time to repair it when the next eruption came on. OK? OK, very good. Uh, and another question from the back there. Thanks very much, Vicky. Thank you. My name is Patsy Can. I'm an ex-OU psychology student. I wanted to ask you, what type of research was carried out after the 2010 no-fly uh, eruption to decide what would be safe for the future? Okay, I think that's one for me. Um, a variety of things. First of all, they went to uh, places in the world where they have frequent volcanic eruptions and ash clouds uh, and where they have a protocol set up for what's safe to fly and what's not. For example, in Alaska, there's a number of um, eruptions very, very frequently uh, put out ash clouds. So they, they learned from, from there, and then they talked to the various aeronautical engineers to decide what was the, the safe concentration of ash uh, to fly. It's a balance between um, you can fly an aircraft through um, an ash cloud um, to up to a certain point. When the ash gets to such a high concentration, um, the ash actually melts within the engine, and then the engine stalls. And this has happened on a couple of occasions in the past. But you have to go right into the heart of one of these plumes of, of ash coming up and to experience that. But the damage to the aircraft can be extensive, even with a modest amount of ash. So there was a, a balancing act taken. Well, we, you can fly through the ash cloud, but only within a certain concentration, because at that point you're getting modest damage to the engine and airframe, but not compromising the safety of the aircraft and the passengers inside. So it was quite an interesting debate at the time. Thank you. Good. Any other questions? This one at the back there. Any other questions while we take that one? Okay, uh, go ahead. Dari from the Open University. Um, I was just wondering if there's any scope or any possibility for a, a volcanic eruption that could be so big in the sort of near future that could um, affect the weather to the point that it affects the climate long term, or is that kind of science fiction? It's happened before. And it will happen again. It depends when you mean by soon. Uh. Uh, soon for a scientist or soon for an average human being? I don't know. <laughs> uh, two, 100 to 200 years or something? Or something like that. 
Yeah, maybe. I, um, <laughs> if we think of things like um, Torba, for example, and um, uh, there's, there's been a, you can expect a large eruption every two to three hundred years. Uh, if we use a volcanic explosivity index, um, where you'll have a mild effect on on the climate. Mm -hmm. And uh, eruptions that tend to take place near the equator tend to affect the climate more because you get into both hemispheres. Eruptions in Iceland and Antarctica tend to affect that hemisphere alone. But the really biggest eruptions that Hazel was referring to, um, they, have a, they occur every once every maybe 100, 200,000 years. And um, there's a general rule in volcanology that the larger the eruption, the larger the precursor signals for that large eruption. So I think if something was stirring uh, at depth beneath, say, Yellowstone or Long Valley or some of the big caldera systems in Argentina, we would expect to see something of it. But that's partly where Fabrizio's work comes in because some of these remote volcanoes don't have any ground-based monitoring. And so ground deformation from satellites would probably be very useful for detecting movements over a period of time. It's working currently. I think the scary thing is that we haven't monitored one of those volcanoes erupting. Um, because fortunately we haven't been around to do it. So our monitoring is getting better and better and, and using the ground-based measurements, we're understanding more about the plumbing systems of volcanoes and, and how they work. And then we can apply that to the remote sensing, the, the, uh, the satellite-based measurements, and we can infer what's going on at the ground because we've got the, the ground-based measurements as well. So you, you need some of both of those. But we haven't had one of those enormous eruptions, so we don't actually know what the precursors are. We can make some pretty intelligent guesses as to what they might be. But how long those precursors would go on for uh, is, is something that I would say there was some debate over. If you wanted to have a little um, Google search for something interesting going on at the moment, look up a volcano called Uturunku, <laughs> U-T-U-R-U-N-C-U. Much easier to pronounce than A if you're legal. Um, I can't remember if it's Bolivia or Peru, but the ground is rising in underneath that volcano at uh, quite a remarkable rate, suggesting that uh, something very interesting is going on underground. But <clears throat> you remember uh, the um, situation on Campi Fregrei, sure. 1983, 1971-1983, in total were three meters uplift, no eruption. Uplift, and then it went back down again. And, well, and not, not, it's, it's difficult to recover the no, deformation, but... Uh, but yeah. basically, why it did not erupt, who knows? <laughs> so sometimes it's a precursor, and sometimes there isn't. All precursors. <laughs> yeah. no, all, well, probably um, another are. question there, sir? Yeah, I'm, I'm Roger Pitfield. I think some of you know me. I, I work at the OU, um, as well as being a former student, etc. cetera. Um, question I like to ask is, some of the maps are interesting with the triangles. There's places I saw I could recognise and other places I couldn't. What, what can you tell us about undersea volcanoes? Were they, were they represented in, in that map? Um, and in what's the, the kind of ratio the between land all, and sea? Uh, um, um, Subaerial volcanoes. So the, the, we don't show uh, underwater volcanoes. But they do uh, exist. They do exist, and uh, if they are uh, deep, you usually don't take care of them. <laughs> no. But uh, uh, recently there were two eruptions, three eruptions. Uh, it was in Tonga, and uh, uh, slightly before two years of eruption in, uh, uh, in the Canary Islands, uh, in uh, Hierro, and another eruption in the Red Sea. In, uh, uh, is, uh, I don't remember the name, but in any case, it's uh, in Yemen. And uh, these are very uh, sharp. What you remark, you can see from satellite, uh, the um, uh, sulfur dioxide. Of course, you don't see the, you don't see the thermal signature. <laughs> no, it's difficult. But you can see uh, anomalous concentration of sulfur dioxide. So it's uh, doing better and better, I find. And some of the most impressive chains of volcanoes in the world are uh, at what we call the mid-ocean ridges that run along the, uh, the plate boundaries. Um, but these are under three, four kilometers of the water, so they don't really pose any danger to us in terms of, of ash clouds. But the, the ocean islands that do pop up above the surface, um, yeah, they, they, they could potentially, places like Tenerife, have had large eruptions in the past. 
um, ash cloud forming eruptions. And those are particularly interesting as well because the um, the hazard is not just the volcanic eruption. You know that's quite significant to where you are, and, and of course if it's big enough, you you can have. Um, uh, effects on the weather for a, for a period of time or, or something even worse but of course you can have tsunami and all sorts of things being caused by eruptions like that so all sorts of hazards associated with those. Just a few questions um, coming in. Uh, people are interested in the different types of volcano. Um, I don't know if it's possible to give us a description of different types of volcano. There's particularly a question in what is a shield volcano? You have a picture, a beautiful picture. Yeah, I think there was a picture of a shield yeah. volcano. Well, a shield volcano is a, a very um, obvious name, actually, because it looks like an upturned shield. It's a very low um, elevation uh, volcano, and, and it, it's, it's made of, of lava flows principally, and the lavas are quite runny, and so they flow away. And so if, you, if your volcano is made of slightly more sticky, viscous um, lava, then it is able to make up a big edifice, but if it's made of slightly runnier material, then, then the edifice is, a, is much lower and forms a shield volcano. Mm -hmm. So it's to do with the stuff it's made of. Any more questions? Sorry, basalt or andesite. Okay, okay. just one in front. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my cat uh, walked over my computer today, so I've got a new <laughs> name if you want one. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel Windsor, Earthwatch. Just to say thank you, Hazel, for all the work you've done with Earthwatch over the last 20 years. Pioneering stuff. The feedback we get from the volunteers is outstanding. If you're going to start your program again, where would you, and starting on a new volcano, where would be an ideal place to start a 20-year program with Earthwatch for citizen science? <laughs> oh, goodness me. <laughs> There are so many volcanoes in the world that I've not visited. Um, goodness, almost any. Um, I've always wanted to do some work on Yellowstone, so perhaps there. And the advantage of that is it, it, it's, it ticks all of the boxes. It, it's got the, uh, the hot pools. It's got the danger, the hazard. Um, it's got the huge caldera. Um, it's, got, it's doing things. It's, it's really moving around. Um, and... Uh, it's quite easy to get to and uh, quite easy to get away from, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yellowstone, thank you very much. We're signing that up then. <laughs> Great question. Any more questions? Yes, gentlemen there. Just wait till the. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm Rita Egan, and I did actually used to work for the Open University. Um, I've actually visited some places, um, I'll give you an example, um, Banos in Ecuador, right beside a, a volcano that erupts all the time, um, to something, I, I do know the name of it, it's just gone out of my head. What I'm curious about is that lots of people do seem to live around volcanoes. Why are they still alive? <laughs> I was born in Naples. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's a good question. Why do people live in Naples, Fabrizio? So about three million. <laughs> so. Why are they still they alive? They're still alive. They, yeah, oh, yeah. Come on. Well, yeah. they don't erupt all of the time, um, and, and the hazard isn't enormous all of the time. Of, of course, when it does erupt, um, it's, it's very significant and, and impacts a huge number of people. Uh, but one of the problems is that there are getting to be more and more people on the planet and more and more people are living closer and closer to volcanoes and therefore we are becoming more vulnerable from that point of view um, and also from the point of view that our societies are so interconnected now as, as, as we were hearing you have an eruption goes on in Iceland devastates air travel in Europe uh, which you know maybe isn't such a bad thing but there were huge economic effects of that if farmers in in Africa and other places for example had crop uh, had uh, produce that they couldn't ship into Europe because of an Icelandic eruption. So we're all very, very interconnected. Um, but it is safe to visit Naples. Uh, maybe the question uh, concerns uh, Tungurawa, probably. Yeah. It was Tungurawa. Oh, I see. Which yes, because uh, it's uh, really in terms of uh, volcanic ash is one of the worst places yeah. to visit. <laughs> Definitely. Tungurawa. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And you, what, why you get so many people living next yeah. to volcanoes is the volcanic ash that falls because it's wonderfully fertile and uh, you know if food is the main thing that you're looking for um, to subsist then of course you're going to to go there and um, 
the, the cycles of these eruptions are sometimes 40, 50, 100 years between eruptions, and uh, that's enough for human memory to fade, to, make it, to, make, to get this, this feeling of it's safe. It hasn't erupted for a long time. I'm safe. And then, of course, uh, these frequent erupting volcanoes. When we call frequently erupting, we're meaning every 100 years or so. We don't mean every year. Uh, we geologists tend to think in slightly longer timescales. <laughs> well, it's an excellent note on which to finish. Thank you once again to our, our speakers, Professor Hazel Reimer, uh, Dr. Dave McGarvey, and of course, Professor Fabrizio Ferrucci, our inspiring academics from the Faculty of Science. A warm round of applause, and thanks again to all of you. I very much hope you all enjoy this evening, whether you're here in person or joining us um, online. For those of us in the room, there's more time now to chat informally over a drink until around 8 o'clock. So do join us if you can. If you're remote and you still have more questions, do continue to send them to us, to us at hashtag OUTalks. We will respond to your questions as soon as possible after the event. But for now, good night.